Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for attending my talk. Um, thank you, Blue Hat, for letting me speak here. So today, I'm going to talk about my research on WPA2. And you probably have heard about this already under the name of crack attacks or key reinstallation attacks. A few months ago, it caught quite a lot of attention. So if you remember something about Wi-Fi being completely broken, this is the talk. So how am I going to structure the talk? Well, I'm first going to explain the core idea of the vulnerability against the so-called four-way handshake. And I'm going to give some background first, how the handshake works, and then I will discuss the details of the attack. After that, I will explain how, what the impact of the attack in practice is, what can an attacker do with this, uh, in which cases is the bug serious, and in which cases is the impact rather low. Then I'm also going to discuss a few misconceptions, because I've seen quite a lot of them floating around uh, on the internet. And finally, I'm going to discuss a few lessons that we can uh, learn from this research, and also in particular about uh, how to coordinate the vulnerability disclosure in a case like this. So let's get started with explaining the attack against the four-way handshake. And the first question I have to answer here is, what is the four-way handshake? And the four-way handshake in a Wi-Fi network is used to uh, authenticate both the client and the access point that they possess the proper credentials. And in any protected Wi-Fi network, this four-way handshake is used at one stage uh, of the connection process. So it's used both in your home network, where you just use a pre-shared password, but it's also used in more enterprise networks, where you, for example, have authentication using a username and uh, a password. And Apart from that, this handshake also negotiates a fresh session key. And this session key is called the PTK, the pairwise temporal key. And after the handshake, once it's completed, this unique session key will be used during in the actual encryption algorithm to protect your data. Now, if you would have asked me one year ago whether this handshake would be secure, I would have answered, yes, it is. I mean, this protocol has existed for more than a decade, and no one really found an attack against it. That's assuming you use a proper password. Because yeah, if you use a password that can be guessed, we can launch dictionary attacks against this handshake. But assuming you use a decent password as an attacker, there isn't much you can do. On top of that, there were even formal proofs of both the four-way handshake and the encryption protocol that is used after the four-way handshake, namely AES CCMP. So really, this seemed like the example protocol. It's properly designed. We have formal proofs. And for a long time, there have been no attacks against it. Unfortunately, we did find an attack. Uh, and in order to explain it, I'm first going to explain how the four-way handshake works. So let's assume we have the following scenario here, where we have a client on the left side and an access point on the right side. And let's say the client wants to connect to the network. And if the network is just a home network where you have a pre-shared password, then the four-way handshake can be started immediately. But let's say you have an enterprise network with, for example, a username and a password. Then we first have an additional stage, which, which is, uh, in this case, called the 802.1x authentication state stage, which in practice basically means there's some kind of radius authentication going on. We don't need to know the details of this. We just need to know that after this handshake, there is some pre-shared secret between the client and the access point. And once the client and the access point have a pre-shared secret, the four-way handshake can start. And as the name implies, the four-way handshake consists of four messages. And the first two are used to transport a random number uh, from the access point to the client and also from the client to the access point. So in particular, we have the first message, which is sent by the access point to the client. And it sends the so-called A nonce, which stands for access point nonce to the client. And in response, the client will generate its own random number, which stands for supplicate nonce. And supplicate is just a synonym for client. So it's here the S nonce, and that is sent to the access point. And once both endpoints uh, have received this random number, they can generate this uh, unique session key called the PTK. And 
how is that done? Well, it's fairly straightforward. You take this shared secret between the client and the access point, which for a home network is just the password of the network. You mix that together with these two random numbers, and the output is the unique session key. So that's fairly straightforward. Now, before we want to continue, I do want to give one remark, and that's that you might have heard about this attack uh, under the name key reinstallation attacks, you know, forcing nonce reuse uh, in WPA2. But I want to clarify the nonce reuse does not refer to the reuse of the A nonce or the S nonce at this stage of the handshake. So here we assume that the A nonce and S nonce, these random numbers, they are indeed random. Um, we cannot predict them. And instead, the nonce reuse refers to the nonce reuse at a later stage, and I will come back to that. OK, so that's the first part of the handshake. So the second part of the handshake, we have two more frames. And a bit simplified, these two messages simply verify that, uh, that both endpoints generated the same session key. So the access point sends message three. The client verifies the authenticity of that message. If that's valid, the client will reply using message four. And one, once both endpoints have uh, received these messages, they can install the session key uh, for use to start encrypting data frames. So the encryption key is now installed. We are sending data frames. And the last part that I need to answer is, how are these data frames being encrypted in a Wi-Fi network? So let's take the following example. We have some plain text data that we want to send. And the encryption process is quite straightforward. We take this negotiated session key, the PTK, and we combine it with a packet number. And this packet number is called the nonce. And the idea is for every packet that is transmitted, this packet number is incremented by one. And if we then combine the session key with this packet number, we get a unique per packet key. And that per packet key is uh, fed to the encryption algorithm, which for a protected Wi-Fi network is always a stream cipher. And a stream cipher is very straightforward. You give it the key, you get us output some key stream, then you XOR the plain text data with this key stream, and you get the encrypted packet that you can send over the network. Now, of course, we do add uh, a header to this uh, encrypted packet where we include the nonce so the receiver can know which packet number was used. And this nonce here, which is also the packet number, can also be used to detect replay. So if an attacker would replay this message again, it would notice, wait, this nonce is already used, meaning someone is trying to replay this message, and I'm just going to drop it. So this construction is quite straightforward, but it relies on one essential uh, fact, and that's that a specific packet number under a certain session key should never be reused. Because if a packet number, so if a nonce is reused, we end up generating the same per packet key, which means we ends up, end up using the same key stream. And then there's key stream reuse. And if there's key stream reuse, we can start decrypting packets and possibly forging packets. So the main question now is, is this packet number indeed only used once? And I already mentioned that this packet number is incremented by one for every packet that is transmitted. So, so far, that's good. The only question is, how is this packet number initialized? Is it some random value, value or some constant? And, well, the answer is straightforward. When we install uh, the session key after the four-way handshake, it's initialized to zero. And that makes a lot of sense. You start your packet number at zero. You always increment it by one. So surely that packet number is never going to be reused. However, we did find a way to trick the client into reusing this packet number. And that brings down the security uh, of this protocol. So how did we manage to do that? Well. Let's take the following scenario, where we again have a client that wants to connect to an access point, but now there's also an attacker present. Uh, and that attacker is here in the middle, and it will uh, try to obtain a so-called channel-based man-in-the-middle position. Now, what do I mean with that? Well, let's say that the access point is operating on channel 6, 
then what we as an attacker do is we forward all the frames that this access point is sending, and we forward it on a different channel. For example, we forward it on channel one. So just to be clear here, this man in the middle position cannot yet be used to decrypt packets. It's only to allow us to reliably manipulate unblock packets. So we are, we're basically taking all the frames that the access point is sending, and we rebroadcast it on a different uh, channel. The idea is now that we force the client into connecting to the access point on this uh, rogue channel. And once we have this uh, channel-based man in the middle position, the first thing that the attacker does um, is just forward the frames of uh, the handshake as normal. So specifically, if we have the first three messages of the handshake, we don't modify that up at all, them, them at all. We just forward them. However, once the client is going to send message four of the handshake, then we do modify the behavior. Because in this case, we're not going to forward message four to the access point. Instead, we're going to block it. So now we are in an interesting situation because from the perspective of the client, the handshake has now completed. It received all the messages of the handshake, and it also replied using all the messages, meaning it will now install uh, the PTK, it will install the encryption key for use. So let's make some space here and continue with the attack. The client completed the handshake, but the access point didn't. It hasn't received message for yet. And the access point will try to recover from the situation by retransmitting a new message for using a new replay counter. And because it uses a new replay counter, this message will be accepted by the client, and the client will reply using a new message for. Now, there's a bit of interesting behavior when the client sends this message for, and that's that this handshake message is now encrypted under the session key. Now, the standard normally says that message four should always be sent in plain text, but every implementation we tested um, will send this in an encrypted fashion, and we will rely on this uh, later on in the attack. And this actually makes a bit of sense, because these handshake messages are normal data frames, and the client already installed the encryption key. OK, so after it replied using message four, the client will now reinstall the encryption key. That's what the standard says. If the client receives message three or a retransmitted message three, it replies using mes a new message four, and you install the keys. And this is where it goes wrong, because now the nonce, this packet counter, is reset to zero. Meaning if we now send another data frame, we will first increment this number, so it will be one, and then we use this value, one, to send the next data frame. And now we have nonce reuse. Uh, both these messages are sent using a nonce value of one, which means key stream is being re reused. And this is bad because now we can break the encryption protocol. So how can we, for example, abuse this to decrypt frames? Well, one technique, there are more techniques, but one easy technique is to observe that we already saw message four in plain text. We also saw message four in an encrypted fashion. And these two messages are almost identical. Some small fields differ, but generally they're the same. Meaning if we just XOR these, we XOR the plain text, we XOR the cipher text, and as a result, we get the key stream. The key stream corresponding to nonce value of one. And well, this data frame here at the bottom that we want to decrypt, it also uses a nonce value of one, meaning it uses exactly the same key stream. So we simply XOR these two, and we have decrypted now a data packet sent under a WPA2 network, meaning we have now broken WPA2. <laughs> so the idea behind this attack can also be applied against different handshakes uh, in a Wi-Fi network. I'm not going to discuss these uh, in detail. If you want to read more about it, uh, there are already some articles online, and you can also always read the paper where these are discussed in detail. So now the question is, what's the practical impact uh, of this attack? And you first have the general impact of a key reinstallation attack. So let's say we either have a client or an access point that's vulnerable to a key reinstallation attack. 
And a client can, for example, be just your smartphone, a laptop, or these days it can even be a toaster. They have Wi-Fi as well. And let's say they're vulnerable to a key reinstallation attack. Then we have two general things that can happen. The first is that if this vulnerable device sends encrypted data frames, we, we as an attacker can force it to reuse a nonce when sending data frames. And this, in turn, can be used to decrypt frames that a device is sending. But there's also a second thing that goes wrong, and that's when we reinstall this key, the device will also reset the so-called replay counter. And this replay counter is, of course, used to detect replays. And if this counter is reset, we, as an attacker, can replay frames that are sent towards the device under attack. So these are the two general impacts uh, that occur when a device is vulnerable to our key reinstallation attack. Now, there are a lot of other factors that also impact uh, the severity of the attack. And one important one is the specific encryption algorithm that is used after the four-way handshake. And if AES CCMP is used, which is the most popular encryption algorithm currently, then the impact is luckily limited to only decrypting on replaying f frames. Now, that's actually already bad enough, um, but yeah, luckily we cannot forge frames if this encryption algorithm is used. Because if we would have been using the older WPA TCAP encryption protocol, Against this protocol, it would be possible to forge frames because the ability to decrypt frames can be used to recover the so-called uh, message integrity key, which is basically just an authentication key. And we would be able to abuse this to forge frames that appear to be transmitted by the device under attack. So in a sense, we're lucky that we're using AES CCMP. Interestingly, there's also a new encryption algorithm that has recently been uh, proposed and standardized, which is GCMP. Um, it's not yet widely deployed, but some people estimate that it will be widely used in, a f in the future. And interestingly, against this new algorithm, we can also recover the authentication key if there is nonce reuse. And here, the impact is even worse than the old encryption algorithm uh, of WPA TKIP because against this algorithm, we would be able to forge frames in both directions. We would be able to forge frames that are sent by the device under attack, and also frames that are sent towards the device under attacks. So in a sense, we got lucky that we're not yet using this algorithm a lot, because otherwise, the impact would have been even worse. So another thing that influences the impact of the attack is the specific handshake we are attacking. For example, if we attack the group key handshake, then the impact is limited to only replaying broadcast frames. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail about uh, why this is the case. Uh, again, I refer to the research paper for more information about this. Basically, it's that only the access point sends real broadcast frames, and the client sends broadcast frames as unicast frames to the access point, and then the access point will broadcast this as real Wi-Fi broadcast frames. Now, as mentioned, the four-way handshake can also be vulnerable against key reinstallation attacks. And we already discussed the impact here. In that case, uh, it might be possible to, it is possible to decrypt frames and to replay frames. And depending on the encryption algorithm being used, it's also possible to forge frames. Now, there's also a third handshake that is vulnerable, and that's called the FT handshake. And the FT handshake is used when you roam from one access point of a network to another access point of the same network. And the idea behind this handshake is that this handshake can be executed very fast. So for example, if you're uh, calling over Wi-Fi and you are roaming from one access point to another, then your call won't drop and you won't notice anything. The interesting uh, fact about this observation is that against this handshake, we are attacking the access point, uh, not the client. And that's because this handshake is initiated by the client, and in contrast to the four-way handshake, where the four-way handshake is initiated by the access point. So in this case, it's not the client that we can attack, but the access point. And another thing that makes the impact worse against the FT handshake is that in this case, we don't need a man in the middle position. We simply need to sniff frames, and then we can replay 
uh, certain handshake messages to cause this key reinstallation on to then cause nonce reuse. So that's not all that influences uh, the impact of the attack. Uh, another important uh, consideration is which specific implementation you are attacking. For example, if you look at iOS 10 uh, on Windows, they don't really follow the standard. And because of that, the four-way handshake is not vulnerable. We cannot attack it. The reason why is because these two implementations don't accept retransmission, retransmissions of message four of the uh, of sorry of message three of the four-way handshake, and because of this, we cannot trigger this uh, key reinstallation. Now, I do want to note here that the group handshake of these implementations is vulnerable, and if you look at iOS 11. This one does implement uh, the four-way handshake according to this standard, meaning iOS uh, 11 does have a vulnerable implementation of the four-way handshake. Now, against Linux, we have an even more interesting uh, situation. There, the Wi-Fi client that's being used is called uh, WPA supplicant. So it's used on Linux. It's also used on Android. And here, instead of reinstalling this secret session key, the Wi-Fi client will just install an all-zero encryption key. And of course, then your victim is using an all-zero encryption key, meaning you can do whatever you want. You can decrypt the frames it is sending, and you can send any data towards it. Uh, so you're basically a rogue access point. So after hearing all this, you might be wondering, OK, that sounds uh, bad. Do you know if my device is affected? And well, probably yes, your device is affected. And to test specifically against uh, which vulnerabilities it is affected, you can use uh, the following uh, scripts on GitHub. So these scripts can be used to test if your client is vulnerable to certain attacks and also if the access point is vulnerable to certain uh, attacks. Now, if you run the script, these scripts, you will notice that certain devices will not be patched yet. Even after all these months, uh, Specifically, for example, Android devices, some of them are known not to be supported for a long time. So we might be wondering now, can we do something about this against these clients or these access points that will not be getting any updates? And luckily, yes, there is something we can do. An access point can prevent most attacks against clients. And the way this is possible is that we can modify the access point to not retransmit message three of the four-way handshake. And if an access point does that, we can also not replay a new message three, meaning we cannot trigger a new key reinstallation. Now, note here that you cannot uh, keep replaying the same message three because it has a replay counter, so we really need the access point to send a new one. And if we prevent the access point from sending a new one, yeah, we cannot just replay the old message three. And the same is true to protect the group key handshake. If we do not retransmit certain messages of the group key handshake, then again, these devices are same. Now, of course, if we're not retransmitting messages, it might be that the reliability of these handshakes uh, are unclear. And of course, if you connect with your vulnerable client to a different network, then it might still be, can still be attacked. Another important remark I want to make here is that if your vendor says that your access point is protected against the crack attack, that does not mean it implements these additional countermeasures. Only if your vendor says that, OK, we our access point defends against cra the crack attack, and we implement additional countermeasures, only then um, can you really be sure that the access point only prevents attacks against clients. So by default, if your access point says, we are now defending against the crack attack. That basically means they're defending against the FT handshake, so against attacks against the access point itself. OK, so that covers the idea behind uh, the attack. I'm now co going to cover a few misconceptions that have been floating around the internet. And the first one refers to the remark I just, make, I just made, and that's that if you have both a vulnerable client and a vulnerable access point, you need to patch both of them. Because if you just patch your access point, well, we can still attack the client. And also, it's the same if you just patch the client, we can still attack the access point. Only if the access point is 
explicitly mentions that it implements these countermeasures, is the client also protected? Another common uh, remark I hear is that, yeah, it's a cool attack, but you, know, you need to be close to the client on the network in order to pull off this attack. Unfortunately, at least unfortunately as a defender, this is not true. Because as an attacker, we can use cheap antenna, and then we can manipulate uh, a Wi-Fi network from up to a range of one to two miles, and we can still carry out the attack. And also, to obtain this channel-based man-in-the-middle attack against the four-way handshake, we don't rely on the signal strength of our rogue access point. Um, another important remark is that some people say that you already have to be connected as an attacker to the network, so you need to know the password. But that's obviously not the case, because if you already know the password, there's no need to carry out any attacks, really. Now, one remark that I do understand is that some people will say that, yeah, you can decrypt frames that are sent right after the four-way handshake. But at that point, is there really interesting traffic? Because, yeah, you just have your ARP request, you have some DHCP packets, maybe a TCP SYN to open a TCP connection, but that's not useful data. Unfortunately, this argument is uh, not true, because what we can do as an attacker is we can let the clients connect to the network, we can let it, for example, visit a website, we can let it open TCP connections, and then when we think the client is about to send interesting data, we just deauthenticate the client, we disconnect it from the Wi-Fi network, and every operating system will then instantly try to reconnect and execute a four new four-way handshake. And while this four-way handshake is in progress, any TCP data that is being transmitted is buffered, and once the four-way handshake is completed, these buffer, this buffered data will now be sent, and we will then be able to de decrypt this buffered data. So to summarize, we can trigger these key reinstallations exactly at a time where we expect the client to send interesting data. Another misconception is that this obtaining this channel-based man-in-the-middle position is hard, but as I mentioned, we don't need to rely on signal strength. We can send special Wi-Fi frames to the client that basically instruct the client to switch to our rogue access point. And these are called uh, channel switch announcements. Another common remark is, yeah, again, it's a cool attack, but the attack complexity is hard. But here I would um, give also the example of, for example, uh, low, mem uh, low level uh, attacks, where it might be very hard to write your zero day, to write your exploit. Yes, writing the script is hard, but once you have a working script, you just need to execute it and you're done. So yes, implementing it takes some expertise, but once you have it, you, know, you just have to execute the script. Another strange remark I heard is that if you use, if you use AES CCMP, you're safe, but as I explained, that's not the case because you can still decrypt and replay frames. Then there are some people that also say that enterprise networks aren't affected, but as I mentioned, every protected Wi-Fi network will at one point use the four-way handshake, meaning it can be attacked. And then there are people who also say the opposite, who are like, yeah, the world is burning down, every Wi-Fi network is vulnerable, you know, you should never use Wi-Fi again, but, you know, let's calm down, it's not the end of the world. Thankfully, we can patch this in a backwards compatible way. So, in a sense, we got lucky. We don't need major modifications to the protocol, we simply need to patch the implementation, and then we can defend ourselves against this. So, I'm now going to cover some lessons that we can uh, learn from this research. And the first major lesson, and it's also the reason why I find uh, this attack to be very interesting, is that the four-way handshake was proven to be secure, and the encryption algorithm after that was also mathematically proven to be secure. But if we combine these two, then suddenly the security uh, guarantees vanish. And what exactly goes wrong here is that, yeah, the encryption protocol is secure, and the four-way handshake indeed negotiates a secret key that an attacker cannot guess. However, we managed to make the encryption protocol use this key several times. And the proof of the encryption protocol explicitly stated, yeah, this key should only be installed once, and then the proof is valid. 
Uh, but of course, if we combine these two uh, entities, then this precondition of the encryption algorithm, namely that this key is only installed once, this did not hold. So I would say here that you know, formally verifying protocols is important. We should keep doing it. Uh, formally verifying implementations is also important. But you know, just because there is a formal proof does not mean a system is suddenly 100% secure. We should still be auditing both the proof itself and also whether the code matches the model that is used in these formal proofs. Another uh, important thing that we can learn from this research is how do you coordinate uh, a vulnerability like this? Because here, the flaw is really in the standard of WPA2 itself, meaning a lot of devices are affected. affected. So, you know, this is not a typical scenario where you have uh, a bug in one product, you simply notify the vendor, and if the vendor doesn't respond, you can go full disclosure, or if he, the vendor does respond, you can negotiate the deadline. You know, that would be a case we understand, but here, a lot of parties are affected, so how on earth are you going to coordinate all this? And the way we approach this is that first we wanted to be sure whether this really is a widespread issue. And the way we tried to confirm this is that we contacted uh, certain vendors which we did not test ourselves. So we have some products of certain vendors which uh, we simply didn't have. And we simply informed them saying, hey, we might have found a flaw in WPA2. We're not sure if your product is affected, but you know, can you please test it? And they, they responded uh, quite fast, and they said, yeah, indeed, you're right, uh, our products are affected. So these are devices we didn't test, and they're saying that, yeah, the vul vulnerability is also present in these devices. So that confirmed to us that, yeah, this is indeed a flaw in the protocol, and most implementations will be vulnerable. On top, on top of that, um, these vendors also gave some feedback on the vulnerability report, so we were able to improve the vulnerability report. And this vulnerability report can then be sent to really all Wi-Fi vendors. But that brings us to a second problem. Is it really a good idea to inform every single manufacturer that makes some Wi-Fi implementation? Because, well, the first problem is, how are you going to determine and look up every company that implements uh, the four-way handshake, for example, it's almost impossible. Um, the second consideration here is that the more parties you notify, the higher the chances that the details of this attack will be leaked. So this is a difficult question. Uh, on one hand, you want to notify as many parties as possible. On the other hand, you want to reduce the chance of there being a vulnerability. Now, we took the easy way out. We simply contacted CERT of uh, Carnegie Mellon University, and we basically asked them to do the coordination for us. But I do want to point out that you know, this is not an easy decision about which companies are you going to notify. In my opinion, the focus here should be on the user. You should notify uh, the products that have the highest uh, user base, and then at one point decide, OK, we now are uh, contacting enough people. Another. Um, interesting dilemma really is once you decide to inform people, how much time are you going to give them um, to patch it? And you, know, you have this with every vulnerability uh, coordination. If you have a long period, um, the chance of leaking might be high, specifically now because we have a lot of different vendors. And if you give them a lot of time, it's also a high chance that these details will be leaked. On the other hand, if you have a short duration, well, then vendors won't have the time to patch it. Um, and here, I, the only real advice I can give is, give is, yeah, just pick a deadline and try to stick to it so everyone knows what they're up against. And another interesting problem here is, what do you do about open source projects? Because they generally implement and discuss their patches you know, on an open mailing list. And if they have a patch, they push it to a public Git repository or SVN repository. So how, well, the way we tackled this uh, case is we discussed the patches in private, just uh, over mail, and we also tested them privately. And 
what we then did, once we were sure that the, passage, that the patches were working, the strategy that we followed, or at least that the strategy of the maintainer of uh, WPA supplicant on host APD followed, is that one week before the disclosure deadline, um, basically the large open source projects, so the open source distributions, were notified that there was a flaw in uh, WPA2 and that they were able to prepare their uh, packages. So, you know, if within this week there was some leak, then all the other companies would have their patches ready as well. So, you know, if at this point there is a leak, it's not a big deal anymore. And looking back, I would say that this vulnerability coordination was uh, quite successful. We didn't have any major leaks. And yeah, not all implementations had updates ready, but in general, I say, uh, I'd say we did well. One other example I want to show here is for if you look at Meltdown on Spectre. Here, they also had this huge problem that you know, a lot of products are affected. And they did have a leak roughly a week before uh, the disclosure deadline. Namely, there was a commit to the Linux kernel where, this word, where there was a very interesting hint, hint which referred to speculative uh, execution. And this led to the community to basically reverse engineer what the vulnerability was. And what they did in this case was that, well, they just re already released uh, the vulnerability advisory. And I think they did the right thing here, because people were aware of what's going wrong. And in that case, yeah, ju you just release your details. So I think what we can learn from this is that if you have you know, this multi-party disclosure process where you have a lot of stakeholders, you should plan for these leaks, and you should have kind of, you should have some uh, interim advisory ready that you can release if the details are leaked, say a week or a few weeks in advance. Now there are some other things that uh, maybe can also be improved. So these are just some ideas. For example, if you look at OpenSSL, they actually give a notification a few days in advance or a week in advance saying, hey, in a few days, we're going to release an update. So, you know, get your security team ready, uh, get your team ready to deploy updates. And this might also be useful in these uh, big cases, for example, in the case uh, of the, our Wi-Fi vulnerability or in the case of uh, Meltdown, where you give an advance notification saying that, you know, get ready in a few days, there will be a major update. And of course, you should mention the severity. For example, OpenSSL mentions whether, they have, whether they're fixing low uh, severity issues or high severity issues. Another thing that could have been improved uh, in our uh, disclosure process is that we m it would have been better if we informed a few more uh, parties. For example, uh, afterwards I found out that certain European uh, certs were not uh, notified. Uh, but again, we also have the problem here is that of that if you notify more people, then the chance of the details leaking increases. So we need some kind of strategy to inform more people, but somehow reduce the chance or the impact of leaks. And maybe one idea is to gradually notify more companies. For example, force, first you can notify companies that have a large user base. Uh, they can start preparing patches already. Then during a second stage, you inform companies with a few more users and so on. Um, and I also noticed uh, that some people use NDAs to, uh, for example, some key, uh, companies share details, they have an NDA in place to uh, prevent leaks. So that is maybe also one thing we can improve this disclosure process. And you know, these ideas, uh, these lessons aren't really new. If we look at uh, this document, namely guidelines on practices for multi-party vulnerability coordination, a lot of these lessons are also in this document. So, you know, if you ever encounter the same situation, do read this document. It contains some useful advice. And the last two points that I want to mention here is that, in my opinion, the focus should always be on protecting the user, not, for example, on protecting the reputation of the company. It's the user we are protecting. And of course, there are a lot of opinions on this, so there will probably be a lot of discussions about how to handle these kinds of situations. So I'm now ready to conclude the talk. So the flaw that I mentioned is in uh, the WPA2 standard itself. It's not just an implementation flaw. 
What I find most interesting is that you know, WPA2 was proven to be correct, yet we still have this vulnerability. And on top of that, not only is this some kind of theoretic uh, cryptographic attack, no, we can do real attacks with this, we can decrypt packets uh, and, and recover sensitive data. And finally, if you want to protect against this, you should update your client and also update your access point if it is vulnerable. So with that, thank you for your attentions, and if there are any questions, do ask them.